Hello, my name is Sevan Kabakian. I'm the country director of Birth for Armenia. Welcome to our podcast, to all the viewers and listeners. I'm here with my colleagues, Kevor Pogosian, representing Rio Armenia, Nazar Sefedian, representing the VIA Fund, and Shushan Keshishan with Habartzakh. Today, we're reminiscing about our very recent trip to Europe. Uh, eight days, eight cities, whirlwind tour, uh, organized by Repat Armenia. And um, after years of COVID lockdown, after uh, travel restrictions, which of which we're all very tired. And in the Armenian context, uh, attacks, war, 2020, 22, 23, Repat Armenia um, decided that um, this is the right time for us to get out of our shell and go and meet our compatriots around the world. And um, they named the tour Engage Armenia. So it was not a welcome to tourists. It was like, you know, come and engage with this country. And there was, a, there was an important element of kind of urgency that, you know, now is the time. It's, it's very important for all of us to really get together and focus on the important things for, for Armenia. So that's what Repat Armenia thought. Uh, do you think, do you agree with that? It, it, why was now the absolute right time for us to be going on this trip? Why, why, why now? If I can start, I think we're facing challenges in Armenia and in our region on a scale that we haven't seen uh, before, at least in our recent uh, history. And I feel like, um, I mean, Armenia was kind of handed independence on a, on a silver platter uh, after the Soviet Union collapsed. Of course, Armenia struggled for it as well. But I feel like we take it for granted sometimes. And given the challenges that we're facing in the region, I've come to realize over the past few years that, in fact, you Armenia, you know, statehood is not a given. You could uh, lose your statehood. You could lose. You could be a puppet state. You, there, there are all kinds of things that could happen to Armenia. And I feel like um, not everyone uh, appreciates this, uh, even in Armenia and in the diaspora, even more so. In the diaspora, we have in many in many communities a very strong. Armenian identity, but not necessarily a strong link to the Armenian state as part of that identity. So given these challenges, I think it's the perfect time to uh, talk about these issues and to tell our brothers and sisters in, in the diaspora communities that Armenia as a state uh, exists. There's lots to do in Armenia. There's lots for you to do in Armenia. And I really loved the way we tried to present specific opportunities for them to engage, as you said, a meaningful engagement. Uh, to tell them that, okay, you don't have to, you know, it's, it, it, you can start with simple steps. You can do one thing out of all these different opportunities. You don't even have to leave your community and physically come to Armenia. There are opportunities to engage from those communities. Mm -hmm. So uh, timing-wise, I think this is why it was a good time. And uh, format-wise as well, I think it was, a, it was a good way to go. Totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> right time, right now. To me, always... It's the right time to come together, you know, like um, to have the state uh, that we were dreaming of and to have this unity and to be able to serve the humanity as a nation, as one single nation with one single like, you know, vision, mission and values. It is really important for Armenians, I believe. So uh, always it was a time, doesn't matter when you start this engagement process. Uh, so I'm very, very happy that we did that. I mean, of course, uh, Repat Armenia did that several times, uh, like during last, like at least 10 plus years, like this engagement, yeah. Imagine Armenia, you know, this event. But now this was a um, totally different thing, uh, a lot bigger because, you know, like uh, all diaspora, diaspora and Armenians had a lot of different opportunities to engage with Armenia. Uh, regarding of in which state they are at the moment, like, you know, starting from just sharing their knowledge and experience, continuing with different types of investments, and then ending up with volunteering in Armenia or repatriation process. So all these uh, different opportunities were on the plate, basically, during this trip, which was amazing, I believe. 
So, and, uh, you know, I mean, I'm very happy that we have started that. I mean, it's not very important um, when, uh, I mean, it was not important when to start. It was very important to start that and then to keep it like going. Like, I believe that we have to organize this type of events. I mean, Repat Armenia, I, I, I would love to see them organizing this kind of events for other parts of the world, you know, for Latin America, for Middle East, for, you know, CSI countries and all, all, wherever we have our patriots. So we better go and see them and show them what is Armenia, why uh, Armenia belongs to them and how they can engage with Armenia and how this engagement will basically make us a lot stronger. And uh, this entity which belongs to them, uh, thanks to this unity, will be a lot stronger. And I mean, so I'm very happy uh, to be part of this and to see how this process is starting and evolving. Shushan, sorry, before we move to you, um, I want to tell all of our listeners that um, uh, we went and spoke with 800 people. Now, you're part of the next 800 that we're speaking to, so everyone's needed in this engagement, including all of you out there uh, following our podcast. Shushan. I just wanted to add that there is also, I'm Lebanese-Armenian, so I know a lot of people in the diaspora, and I always hear this from my friends and colleagues in the diaspora, that they're searching for new ways of engagement. So it wasn't just a unilateral thing where we decided that, you know, it's time for the diaspora to engage with Armenia. There's also the kind of opposite side of things where people in diaspora, especially the youth, are looking for new, meaningful, impactful ways to engage with Armenia. So it's important to find ways that to channel that kind of motivation and drive. And especially with all the events in Artsakh, it's easy for our compatriots in the diaspora to feel kind of disenfranchised or to feel like there's nothing left to do. Mm-hmm. So it's important mm-hmm. to kind of be to show people that, no, despite everything going on, there is a way for you to be meaningfully engaged in our country. Right. And actually, um, it's a good point, uh, Shushan, because uh, the pre-trip uh, surveys that we did showed a high level of interest in engagement with Armenia, not just affinity or love, but actual engagement. And that's why people were coming to the to the events. Um, the point that you made um, earlier, Nazareth, it's really interesting, and maybe we can just go off on that point a little bit. The, the point about Armenian statehood and Armenian, um, the feeling of being Armenian, outside of Armenia. For many people, and, you know, for maybe understandable reasons, uh, there is not the connection between the two. People feel fully Armenian. They realize their Armenianness outside. Now, we're out there, we're telling them, you know, Armenian statehood is there, and you need to be part of the Armenian statehood. And there are some narratives that, uh, well, you know, no, diaspora is important, and diaspora in and of itself is an Armenian existence. How 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 do we make that connection for people who are living in their own existence, feeling extremely Armenian, extremely proud, active in their communities, maybe, but the Armenian state is not part of that equation? How do we? Were you successful in making that uh, connection uh, on this trip? Did you have these conversations with people? Uh, you know, I want to I start with a little story. I mean, uh, right after our trip, Engage Armenia, I stayed in Europe for another 10 days. And my um, right after that, I was in Paris and there was a... Uh, this uh, conference, science conference called Armenian Diasporas in Motion. And uh, a lot of different, uh, you know, scientists came together from diaspora, from Armenia, like other nation- nationalities as well. So there was a, this conversation. Uh, one of them is saying, you know, we have to change these things in our homeland so we can fix this problem and then that problem, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the other is saying, but I believe that in the, in homeland we should fix the first this problem and then we can talk already about that. And the third saying, you know, each of us in our homeland is supposed to do this. And this first guy saying, no, hold on, what do you mean like each of us in our homelands? Um, when I'm saying homeland, I mean Republic of Armenia. And the second guy saying, no, 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 when I was talking about homeland, this was about Western Armenia. I mean, my grandfather, grandmother are from there. And then they realized that they're using the ser- same term, basically, but uh, in different meanings. So 
this understanding of the state that we have, the state is very important. So it doesn't matter which, which was your uh, homeland, like Van, for example, I don't know, Adana, or, or you consider your homeland already France, Paris, because it's already third generation that you're living here, there. You have to understand that there is a state which is your own. So I believe that from our state perspective, the humanity is divided into three basically groups. So the first group, these are citizens of Armenia, doesn't matter what is their nationality. And then the second group, Armenians, doesn't matter uh, which citizenship do they have. Mm -hmm. And the third group are not Armenians who are not Armenian citizens. So based on these three layers, uh, Republic of Armenia is supposed to deal with these people differently. Like, you know, your, um, let's say, obligations and um, how should rights. I say? rights, your rights and obligations towards state of Armenia is supposed to be different uh, based on this. I mean, are you a citizen of Armenia or not? And if not, are you Armenian, your nationality or not? Huh? So if we figure out all these rights and uh, obligations towards Armenia and then, uh, like, you know, uh, transmit all this information towards Pyrk. So everyone will know, doesn't matter where do you live, uh, what is your citizenship, but if you are Armenian, you own this country in some, like, you know, uh, meaning of the word, and you have your obligations and you have your uh, rights uh, concerning this entity. So I believe that there's a huge work that we have to do. So every Armenian will consider this as his or her like own thing where he has to or she has to invest mm -hmm. and then she can gain. So, I mean, there's a huge work that we have to do for this. Yeah. During the discussion I had a few months ago, <clears throat> also kind of a podcast format, uh, there was a very interesting um, comparison made. Basically, it's a bit primitive, but it, it works. I, imagine you uh, live somewhere, you have a house, you own the house, you feel at home in that particular house. And then uh, a, a distant relative you have passes away and you inherit an apartment in a building somewhere far away. That apartment is yours, you own it. But you may or may not feel a connection to it because that's a very distant relative. You never spent any time there and so on. So you have a choice. You could go see the apartment. You could go take care of it, renovate it. Uh, you know, otherwise it might uh, fall into disrepair or you might not because it, it requires resources, requires your time. Um, for many of the people in the diaspora, this is what the Republic of Armenia uh, is, presumably. It's uh, something that we know we have. Uh, hopefully they know that there is a Republic of Armenia. But they might not feel a strong connection to it because ancestrally, as you said, they come from uh, another part of Armenia. historic Armenia. Yeah. Um, and if they don't engage with it, then it might fall into disrepair. And Gevork made a point earlier about unity. I want to stay as practical as possible. I don't believe in uh, a magical unity that we we can have as Armenians. You know, we what have about we practical have, unity, not well, a magical one. <laughs> exactly. So we have we have two kinds of Armenian. We have two Catholicoses in the Armenian. You know, it's not it's not we don't have one of of anything, and that's fine. In this imagined building that we all have as Armenians that we inherited from a distant ancestor, we can each choose to uh, design our apartment differently. As long as we believe that the building should stand, our corner of Armenia, our uh, our imagined corner of Armenia in the Republic of Armenia can be different. We can have different political views. We can have different views when it comes to uh, even the future of the Republic of Armenia. But we can still believe that the Republic of Armenia should have a future of prosperity. You imagine that road to be this way. I imagine it to be this way. And we each do our piece of work to take Armenia further along that direction so that maybe the real road is this way. And we're each pushing in the right direction for the Republic of Armenia as a whole. So I try to come from it, uh, come at, at, from a very practical point of view. And for me, the question also is, what can Armenia give to our brothers and sisters in the diaspora? And from all the Armenians that I know who've come to do programs like Birthright or who have come to engage with different opportunities in Armenia, I would say all of them, but I'm sure there are some maybe who haven't had this experience. It has been a transformative experience. Me as well. I grew up in India until the age of 18. And my identity as an Armenian uh, in India was very weak. I didn't know this at the time. 
But my identity really began to form here in Armenia. Here is where I learned what it is to be an Armenian, everything. I mean, before that, you know, I didn't know this at the time, but I wasn't, it wasn't a very strong identity. So Armenia had a transformative effect on me as well. So for me, it's difficult to sell this transformation to someone because you have to experience it. So we have to find a way to bring people here for any kind of small engagement. Or again, as I said, start the engagement from even outside. They don't even physically have to come here. And a, a percentage of them will feel something and that engagement will grow stronger. Well, Shushan, um, I mean, on this topic, you know, um, if you can maybe a- answer the question in, in this way, there's a book by a uh, Berkeley professor, I forget the name, I believe, Berkeley professor, um, which basically argues that people live uh, with a 100 meter, I mean, they have their impact and they have their effect about the 100 kilometers surrounding where they live. People are exist in, 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 in zones. Now, we're out there in Europe, we're out there in eight different cities, and we're telling basically people to get out of that zone in a way, to some extent, be part of a common vision that, you know, Kevork is talking about. Is that is that doable? Did you find that during your trip that you were able to invite people to get out of that 100-kilometer zone and see what you're saying? What kind of interactions did you have with people? I think... In this regard, the best thing we can do is share our experiences. Uh, Because in my case, I went far beyond my 100 kilometers. I moved to Artach. And Mm -hmm. just telling this to people, I realized I would get the reaction like, oh, wow, that's possible. Like people kept asking me, don't you regret it? Or um, why did you decide to do so? Wasn't it difficult for you? And just sharing my experience would get people thinking that this is something that they can also consider for themselves moving to Armenia or visiting Armenia or doing something in Armenia. Mm-hmm. I think sharing our example or maybe leading by example in uh, in many cases is also something that's very important in this case. So so the issue of, um, you know, s- serving by example, you know, all of us, except for Kewak, I'm sorry. <laughs> all of us are kind of lived outside and we moved to Armenia. And if, we, if that really does serve an ex- as an example for others to say, you know, I want to follow that example. Um, to what extent do we become just, you know, nice stories that people kind of are wondering about? Well, how did you do that? How did you, are you having problems and so on? But that's your story. It's not my story, they say, right? So how do we make our stories become their stories? Because that's when they act on it. Otherwise, we become, you know, like actors are on a stage. They clap, they applaud. They, they all go home to, again, have a zone of influence of 100 kilometers. How do we make our stories become their stories? How do we make Armenia's story become part of their story? I mean, this was the challenge that we had, not just on this trip, but in general that, that, that we have. What were some of your experiences? I mean, to be honest, um, I think on this trip as well, and in general as well, we have to understand that some people will engage with Armenia for Armenia. But many of those people, you know, because it's for Armenia, they are already engaging. They're finding they don't need us. They're not looking. They're not waiting for us. Exactly. They're not waiting for us to come. So what I found powerful with the Engage Armenia tour was that we were presenting opportunities that would speak to them, not necessarily that the Armenia would could potentially be an added bonus. So, for example, it was it could be about uh, in our case, it was about social enterprises. So people who are interested in social businesses in general could say, oh, that's interesting. I didn't know we had them in Armenia as well. Or I care a lot about people with disabilities. Maybe that's where I can engage. And it's also in Armenia as an added bonus or volunteering, for example, right with birthright. You have a whole uh, range of organizations that you can choose. You could volunteer for a sports NGO. You could volunteer for an education NGO. So it's the cause plus the fact that it's Armenia that kind of takes you over that threshold of, okay, I'll try this for a few months. So it's not just Armenia for Armenia, because as I said, those people don't wait necessarily have to wait for us. And um, what I really have loved about life in Armenia and what I think people will see when they come here and do something here is that you actually see your impact. It's it's a small country. It's much easier for you to 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 feel how you personally have made a change in a person's life or in in the in the life of a of a sector or whatever. So um, this is this gives a person meaning irrespective of whether it's in Armenia or in you know wherever. So um, that's why. I believe that Armenia offers all these opportunities 
Plus, it's Armenia for Armenians. Even if you were not Armenian, you would find many of these opportunities here and it would be, you know, you would have a fulfilling life here. So that's why coming back to the practical side and, and Gevor proved my point earlier, we can be, we can completely disagree on topics and still work for the benefit of Armenia because having been in Armenia for more than 25 years now, it's great to have a, a, a united vision. That would be amazing, maybe someday, but I'm not going to wait for that. I don't think anybody should wait for that. Yeah, sure, sure. I think the United Vision can be, sh should be the success of Armenia. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. That's, so, the, that's the United Vision. I would, say, I would say we can have different opinions as long as we have the same values. And part of those values would be, uh, because our vision for a successful, successful Armenia could be different as well. What is a successful Armenia? But as long as we want to see Armenia successful, prosperous, I might see it one way, you might see it a different way, and we push the country in our respectful directions, it could work. So basically, um, I would say that that's, that's, that's the kind of key to it, that you, we we're engaging, we're providing opportunities that have a meaning in and of themselves, plus the fact that it's an Armenia that could really be that additional magnetic pull that we need. Well, we basically embarked on this tour, 10 of us. I mean, four of us are here. We're a group of 10 people um, to convey a message, inspire, inform, and so on. Well, the reverse part of this, what did, what did we learn from this trip? How were we different when we came back as opposed to when we got on the airplane to leave? Armenia to go there. How was it beneficial to us to continue the work that we're doing? How are we doing it differently? How are we doing, doing it maybe smartly, better uh, from this trip? Um, Mr. Shanjan? Yeah, I can say that I gained a very important skill, which is to uh, express or tell about my work in a very brief way, like as brief <laughs> as the possible, five <laughs> the five minute rule. But honestly, it's a very important thing because having yes. to summarize your entire career in a span of five minutes in a way that's engaging, in a way that covers all the basics really made me reevaluate everything, rethink the way that I communicate about our work, rethink the way that mm -hmm. I advocate for many issues on the ground. So it was a very important exercise and especially doing it eight times in eight different cities, yeah. you kind of get the opportunity to understand what the cross-cutting issues are or which sentence it is that really gets the audience moving. Mm -hmm. So it mm -hmm. was a chance for me to kind of try it out in a few different places. Initially, I, I was a bit more stiff and then you told me to relax a bit. So I was a bit more, you know, kind of flexible a bit more. And uh, I understood what it is what the core of my message should be when I talk about our work and when I talk about Artsakh more broadly. Mm -hmm. So that was definitely something that I brought back with me, which I'm trying to now kind of infuse in our work. One interesting thing for me was, so in each city, when we started the event, we asked for a show of hands, how many people have been to Armenia? Mm -hmm. And 85, 90% of our audiences had always been to Armenia at least once. But the conversations I had after each event, like during the networking sessions, talking to people, I felt like for many of them, the reaction to the event was, oh, mm -hmm. and that's like a seed planted in their head. So they'd been to Armenia at least once. And usually, you know, you come to Armenia the first time is the tourist of Karni Gerard, you know, the, the, the basics. But now they have an additional piece of information or that, oh, this is happening in Armenia as well. Oh, there's also this opportunity. Oh, there's also this. So you plant a seed in their heads, but it's a very long process. I think that was my biggest takeaway, that this is something that needed to be done, but it needs to be done again and again and again, not just in different communities, but in the same, same community. community. Right. We need to right. work with this group of people to also bring other people who are less engaged with Armenia to come to these events, people who've never been to Armenia before. So it's a long process because you're asking, you're basically asking someone to make a big change in their life, whether it's just two hours of their time per week or per month, or it's volunteering for months or it's investing, it's quite a big change. So it takes time to plant that seed, you water it. So now they have a seed in their heads. Mm -hmm. They follow the news from Armenia. Maybe they get an email from Gevork about yeah. something. Maybe they get Shushan's newsletter. So it kind of helps that plant sprout and grow into something. And, you know, you might see the impact of this one trip uh, a year down the line or nine months down the line when one person engages in a meaningful way.
there was a there was a general appreciation for this large size of group being there and presenting all these diverse opportunities because even if they had heard about some things that they can do this depth presented in one hour um, and then I think our continuous uh, contact and connection with them is important and people are coming up and saying well thank you for doing this because you know, we either get, uh, you know, a dance group coming here and performing and we're just the audience, mm -hmm. right? Um, or in this case, we became the focus. It wasn't you. We became the focus. I mean, the audience was the performance. The audience was the central focus because we came we came for them not, not to do a performance. <clears throat> and the one, one thing that I... I I knew, but it kind of reinforced in me that um, everyone is so different. Even within the same cities, people are so, so different. Someone immigrated from this place. Someone is second generation from that city already. One's um, desire and interest in us being there was one thing. Someone else talking about something else. And to be with every person where they're at and be in their community is so important. So the the you know it's a digital age, right? Every, everyone's doing social media, everyone's watching you know videos and TikToks and whatever, right? But bringing a fresh air of you know actually being where they live, they appreciate it more. You understand, you're able to answer the specific questions in a customized way that fits their purpose and not just, here's a video for everyone. So you, you take whatever you want from it. But no, this was, and I, I don't know, for your case as well, I don't know, after the after our pitches, after our official part, mm -hmm. when we opened it to for people to come and mingle with us, there were so many people who just came up and asked questions and they were interested and uh, how do I do this? How do I do that? Was that the case with you folks as well? Did, did people really come up afterwards? And Yeah, and I think one thing that's important is our group was very diverse as well. And people mentioned this. Our group was also as diverse as each, as each diaspora community. And there was a very positive dynamic within our group that the audience sensed. Yeah. And this is some feedback that we got as well. They sense that, oh, like you're you're a pretty like cohesive group, like this but and this is I think a positive message that we didn't necessarily intend. Uh -huh. But the fact that we are so diverse, doing all kinds of different things. Someone's been in Armenia just three years, someone's been in Armenia all his life, someone's been in but where you could sense that positive dynamic, especially in the later cities as we were kind of bonding better as a group. I think that sent a very positive message to the audience as well in that, uh, you know, our, our differences as Armenians is something that we've has been forced upon us, you could say, by history. But it's something that doesn't have to hold us back at all. In fact, it's something we can use as a, as a positive force. Yeah, that was really great one. I mean, to, to, to see... Um those different people and this cohesion and uh, the support that we had towards each other. I mean, for example, somebody's coming to me with some business idea and I know that this is not my yeah. not my yeah. person. I'm sending him to Go her, to for example. Yeah, you know, this is the guy who can really help you. And the other person is coming, you know, he can come to Armenia, but he has a lot of knowledge to share with. So, uh, so she's bringing him to me. And I mean, this process of uh, and again this dynamic process and this cohesion that we had it it, it was really something uh, that this audience saw and uh, I believe uh, this gave a lot of like warm uh, emotions to all these people and this actually helped a lot while talking to them later and I had some uh, other meetings after uh, our trip with the same people who basically were were among our audience in Paris especially like a lot of people were writing so if you're gonna be here let's meet again like separately in cafe whatever and 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 I was feeling this uh, warm uh, like emotions from them be because they saw whatever you were just uh, uh, describing huh and yes I mean if we will have opportunity to organize these kind of trips more often. I believe that this engagement, uh, like, you know, the meaningful engagement uh, will become um, reality. Where should we go next? We should go everywhere. We should go everywhere. But where, where do you think is the immediate next uh, Maybe Middle next East? Stop? 
Middle East. Yeah, con- considering the situation there, a lot of people would love to see like uh, good opportunities to engage and uh, with Armenia and come to Armenia. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> you, 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 you would say uh, better. I mean. All of you. I mean, is Middle East yeah, sure, a good destination as the yeah, next one? I, um, I don't know. I want South America. I don't know. <laughs> That's my <laughs> next. Because there's a big Armenian community. And, and the beach. In, and the in beach. Like Brazil, That's, a, yeah. <laughs> That's an added bonus there, yeah. Yeah, South America, North America. I mean, as I said, we have to go back to these communities as yeah. well. There's still a lot to do in these very communities. Um, France, we went to four cities, but there's still a huge community that we haven't uh, reached yeah. in other cities as well. And Papua New Guinea as well. That's right. Yeah, yeah with the six <laughs> Armenians living there. Yeah, I mean, every Armenian counts, you know. I mean, every Armenian is important nowadays. I don't know about the cost effectiveness, but sure, why not? Um Well, we were a group of 10, very intense. We're like from train to airplane, train to airplane, to hotel, to venue, and so on. It's running around. But we had some light, nice light moments, funny moments as well. <clears throat> what was what was your lightest and funniest moment that you remember? Nazareth and his little briefcase, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, for me personally, it was uh, obviously it took a lot of energy, it took a lot of resources. Also having to, to switch to French uh, for the first time in my life, making presentations and responding to questions on the panel. So on the last day, after after eight days of little sleep and uh, lots of uh, emotions, Uh, my brain refused to translate uh, in time, and I ended up saying that I only have two kids instead of three kids. Oh. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yes, uh, because I was talking about my brother's family first and comparing his life in the U.S. to mine in Armenia. So maybe me, it was in French because it wasn't French exactly. Oh, okay, so, so that's why I didn't understand yes, that so part. <laughs> by the time the words came out of my mouth, I had already denied the existence of one of my three children. That was a funny. It's moment usually the other way. <laughs> People deny it. Yeah. My, well, when, when they're teenagers, they deny the existence of their parents. But no, my kids are not teenagers yet. Did you have a funny moment, Kevork? So this set on Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> this was my French song funniest moment. <laughs> yeah. A lot of those. I mean, yeah, it was, it was funny overall. <laughs> like, funny, not like funny. It, it was fun. The, the real fun for me. I don't know. I've seen like some of our group members friends in different situations becoming kind of a little bit nervous a little bit worried but i mean for me all this experience was wonderful in every meaning of the world i mean you know i mean you know um i really really enjoyed all the process even you know those people who were arguing why do you speak like english when you're attending Armenian event in France, for example. <laughs> so, and, and, and this was very interesting for me as well. I mean, uh, I, I was trying to put me in the uh, shoes of every person who's arguing with something. And but thanks to that, I, I, I really understood them. Why did they do that? And, and, and then I understood that how good that uh, they can like be this straightforward, uh, talk whatever they think. Uh, and uh, and I was here to understand uh, Spurk. So this was the opportunity for me to understand what they really think, uh, regardless of what is the ethical <laughs> way <laughs> of, of talking. So, I mean, even these situations uh, was fun for me. I really loved all those like moments and people. I don't know. I don't remember remember like really funny things. Well, like, I think uh, all of us will remember uh, one of our mention. colleagues not having his luggage arrive. Ha ha ha, It and wasn't he, funny. There was sad thing. Well, <laughs> I mean, he was buying a lot Dark of... Dark humor. My, <laughs> my, my, my luggage was, was always being carried around by him because he didn't have a luggage. So my, my luggage was being carried around by him. <clears throat> well, we have, uh, we have our uh, friends um, listening to us here online. If we're to kind of conclude on... Um, a specific message that you want to give these people. Because, again, if, if we go to the beginning of what we talked about and the name of the tour, Engage Armenia, and the time for engagement is now, as much as there are positive and good things that are happening, and there are enormous challenges um, ahead of us. And everyone's participation in whatever capacity they have is absolutely essential now. So 
What would, what would be your message to our message to whom podcast? To this one or to this one? To all those people here <laughs> listening to us, to all our podcast viewers and listeners, one one message for them to take away, be inspired by, because everyone's needed. So the umbrella, needed. umbrella message is engage with Armenia. So this is uh, the umbrella message, I believe. But I mean, under this. You can, we can have a lot of different messages, so let's come up with some engaging messages. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like a bit of a cliche, but you hear very often that, uh, you know, uh, in every crisis there is an opportunity. And it's, it's a cliche, but it's true. And uh, I want to look at the camera as I say this. Um, irrespective of whether we're talking about the crisis in the region or maybe even the crisis that we go through as individuals, Armenia has something to offer uh, in terms of what it can do for you. And I know people who uh, have these moments in their lives when they're not sure what their next step should be, so they want to take a break. And Armenia is a great place to take a break, to do something maybe completely different to what you do in your everyday life. And then you see a different path for yourself. So for me, this message of engage with Armenia because Armenia is in crisis, the region is in crisis, maybe even the world is in crisis, is very, very valid. But at the same time, I want to make it about the individual as well. I don't want it to be this thing where, oh, I have to sacrifice myself for Armenia. I have to. No, you have to do it for yourself. And irrespective of who you are, what you do, Armenia has something to offer you. But you have to come here and find it for yourself. And uh, this is, I would say, the key message that I believe is valid for anyone, anywhere, anytime, any Armenian for sure. Uh, there is something here for you. All you have to do is come and find it. You know, I believe that engaging with Armenia is the path uh, to your personal happiness. It is. It really is. And as Nazareth said, like every uh, like crisis has opportunities in it. So big crises has big opportunity. I mean, have big opportunities. So right now we we are in a huge crisis. So we have huge opportunities, you know. And uh, as soon as we are engaged together, and as soon as we are y united, we can harvest, you know, a lot from these crises, is a lot of big, huge opportunity. I really believe that. And, and we can see that afterward. I mean, anyways, so yes, I believe that this engagement process is path uh, to, to your happiness, for sure. Yeah. Just to add on everything, because I agree with Nazareth's brilliant message, but uh, Armenia can give you a sense of fulfillment, which is very difficult to find elsewhere. Um, so I think everyone should experience that sense of fulfillment mm. at least once in their lives. And don't deny that. Come to Armenia. Find your sense of fulfillment. You can go back if you want, but just do it. So, And I guess to wrap it up, uh, I would say just, uh, just start your process. Don't overthink this. Just start. Inquire. In the inquiry is the start of a process. Ask us. Take small steps. You don't have to jump, you know, an entire ocean. Um um, start and see where that path leads you. You know, sense of uh, additional adventure in life is always a good thing. Yeah, and also they 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 have. I mean, each uh, Armenian uh, has in Armenia like a lot of like-minded people, friends, relatives, ones who are waiting for them, who will support them with anything they might need in here. I mean, and even this is not the place where you're coming. Uh, without understanding where are you coming. I mean, this is the place where a lot of uh, people are waiting for you. And especially this, this, these 10 organizations, they were talking about this, like, and uh, giving a lot of different opportunities for engagement, meaning that these people are waiting in Armenia for you all. I mean, yes. <laughs> we're waiting. We're Let waiting. We're, we're waiting. waiting. Home. <laughs> well, it was nice meeting up again, folks. We should be doing this more often. Thank you very much. Thank you very and much. And thank you to all of our audience.